And uh, I said, what would you be doing if you weren't here in that time in Petersburg, Kentucky? That's right, you'd be watching Petersburg CSI. That's what it's, <laughs> is there Las Vegas CSI? There is, right? Yeah, there is. Is there Sparks? Is there a Virginia City? CSI, Virginia City? Uh, these are uh, towns in the <laughs> So uh, I made the point that our whole society relies on science, uh, the body of knowledge, and especially the process of science. And what surprised me at that thing, as you may know, there are about two dozen people who were strangely on my side. <laughs> like, whoa, how did you guys get tickets? <laughs> tickets sold out. They really sold out in two minutes. It was really something. And, uh, if you don't mind, and if you do, we start texting or whatever, tweeting, whatever the kids do. Uh, I see many of you with the electric computer machines. Uh, <laughs> I'll just go over a couple things that were not only to me important, but they were also kind of fun. Uh, here's the famous painting of Noah's Ark where the animals are, with great discipline, lining up. Sure, there's a lamb and there's a grass. Uh, but the premise of the bit, as we say in comedy, is that you'd have a 500-foot boat, you'd have eight zookeepers, 14,000 individuals, the animals, and then every plant on Earth would be underwater for a year. And I don't know how much you do, how much gardening you mess with. <laughs> That's really a long time. And so uh, I pointed this out to the audience. But you know, if you're a believer, this doesn't mean much. But uh, this was uh, another fun one. It's been 4,000 years since Ken Ham's flood. And so there are 7,000 kinds. Now, this is something that Jeannie and Josh and you guys who are into this are all very familiar with. It. I hadn't spent that much time with it. I had to, do, had to catch up quickly. And you go, know, when are you going to catch up? No, I'm still working on it. But what he's got is 7,000 kinds. And this is somehow inferred from uh, the Bible that's written in English today in America and the U.S. And uh, the 7,000 kinds then have led to the 16 million species we have today. Now, I chose 16 million because I felt that it's a memorable number. And it's based on a little algebra I did. But you guys, when we start counting all the viruses that are at sea and just the beetles that we haven't found, 16 million is very conservative. I mean, certainly 50 million it might even, if you start counting viruses and phages and so on, it might be much closer to 100 million. So if you have 15 million, and then I subtracted the 7,000 for fun. <laughs> there are no pretty significant digits, so it's fun. Uh, I subtracted the 7,000, and then you get 4,000 years, and 365 and a quarter. It's not quite a quarter. There's 11 minutes that I can for it. Then you need 11 new species every day. Not, okay, not 11 new animals or plants that you notice. I mean, 11 new species every day. I mean, wouldn't the you know, local paper mention this? <laughs> Some of these, these 
these extraordinary things that this uh, ministry embraces. Really in trouble. And then I hope somebody went to see it. It was a little weird. Uh, the film came out. Did anybody see it? <laughs> anyway, if you didn't see it, there's, they have these magic trees that strip the, the branches off of uh, magic tree ghosts that uh, strip the branches off of They make lumber, and then uh, the eight unskilled family members could build an ark. <laughs> it wasn't, it's was just a new part, a new feature. Uh, then uh, uh, you may, if you've never been to the uh, Creation Museum, and I gotta say, uh, I'm, I've worked for a long time in children's museums and the science centers. I've never, uh, never seen a museum that was all that had no artifacts. You know, I'm not kidding. He, along with this idea of historical science and observational science, sort of double speak terms, he uses the term museum for a place that has nothing from the past. They're you know, all uh, animatronic dinosaurs and stuff. And uh, Eve is, and Adam, Adam's a very good looking young man, and he's kind of hot. Charming turn of events. Uh, Don Prothrow, I must thank him. He's probably here. Woohoo! Don Prothrow and Michael Sherman really helped me out. They really coached me. Don is quite the geologist. And he, uh, well, hey, you know, Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, though, too. So Mammoth Caves is layers and layers and layers of limestone. And the building is made largely of limestone. And I pulled over on the side of the road, Route 69, an interstate. And picked up three rocks. We had some uh, our uh, um, highway employees had done some blasting, and I picked up three pretty good sized pieces of limestone. There were some shelly fossils right there. I mean, there was they're not hidden. They're just every piece of rock you pick up in Kentucky has a fossil. <laughs> no, really. And it's, it's quite an irony. And so that those guys uh, built this building and lived their lives without any acknowledgement of it. It's really. Uh, I mean, it's, it's laughable, and it's inane or silly, but it's also a little creepy. You know, where you have uh, raising a, a generation of science students without any knowledge of uh, their homeland. Then it was fun for me to talk about the top minnows, and if you guys don't know top minnows, who doesn't? Uh, they're very cool, and there was a fabulous uh, study done by Bob uh, Rudenick, I don't speak Dutch, Rudenick. Uh, who found that when the certain populations are isolated and they don't have enough reproductive or don't have as much reproductive opportunity as they might otherwise, they start reproducing asexually. And then when they get uh, some variety back in the mix, they go back to producing sexually. If you're not hip, this is the theory of the Red Queen, where uh, Alice is in, is in, uh, in through the looking glass. She's not an Alice in Wonderland. She meets the Red Queen. The Red Queen, you know her. I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm not a biographer of Lewis Carroll, but apparently he smoked dope. <laughs> stuff. I mean, uh, and so she's some sort of red uh, chess piece queen person thing. And when you're with her, she's sliding. The whole world is sliding along, and you have to run to keep up with her. Uh, otherwise, you fall off, and Alice says, uh, you know, where I come from, if you run all day, you, you end up somewhere else. <laughs> and the queen, the red queen says, that seems a very, very slow sort of country, but uh, that apparently is how evolution is. If you, if you don't continually come up with a new mixture of genes, you'll fall off the treadmill, and you treadmill life. And your enemy is not, as you might think, uh, lions and tigers and bears. My. Which are, yes, which are troublesome, uh, I guess. Uh, they'll kill you. Uh, but your real enemy is germs and parasites. And that's where the, the, uh, the uh, top minnows really revealed this with these cysts that uh, uh, Bob uh, Grimbuk uh, wasn't even sure the genus, they're so, the cyst is so common. And then I pointed out to people in the audience that uh, uh, there's a lot of talk in creationism about gaps. And uh, whenever there's a gap 
and we or scientists fill the gap, what then you've done is create two more gaps on either side of the thing you fill. And I talked about Tick Tollick, who is uh, this fabulous uh, fish lizard guy or gal that lived in uh, what's now Canada. It was a different government, I think, uh, <laughs> 350 million years ago, 10 to 25 million years ago. And these researchers went, figured this animal must have existed. They found this Devonian swamp fossilized in uh, northern Canada. And they went there and they found the fossil. And that is just, just cool. That is just, yes, a pod, yeah. I just, I just mentioned the word audience. Everybody, I strongly believed that my audience was not Mr. Ham. It was not his ministry, except to a limited extent. There were some young people there from his ministry. But my audience was everybody online. I, I got to think, I cannot get over how many people have come up to me. I was in the airport today, I was on the plane today, I was everywhere. People who watch that debate, it's just a striking thing. And I guess the reason is this issue of whether or not evolution is as true as gravity is still in doubt in people's minds. And so this, I claim that doing this debate, going into the lion's den, is raising awareness, and I hope soon we will reach a tipping point on science literacy. And then, uh, Signage. 
and it's hard to read because I took this picture with my phone at night, sorry. Big Bang Theory, you've got to be kidding me, God. <laughs> Why would he kid about something like that? <laughs> Why? Why would some entity make all this stuff up? Just because it's beyond what you might think at first. Like the 6,000 year star light thing. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so I presented, I, I interviewed uh, Bob Wilson. Uh, who was one of the discoverers of the microwave background radiation. This is really quite a thing, everybody. You know, people did these, uh, astrophysicists did these calculations predicting that if there had been a big bang, well, except it's in outer space, it just goes. And so it's really easy to get carried away with this. And it wouldn't matter 
I mean, it's just a niche. It's just a few thousand people with, if I may, a few millions of dollars building this eccentric facility in this beautiful part of the, of the U.S., uh, right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. You know, it's a, it's a pastoral, it's a horse racing, it's lovely, it's Kentucky bluegrass, it's great. It wouldn't matter. They would be isolated, and we'd, we'd worry about the science things and so on. But it gets more serious than that. Uh, Ken Ham on Answers in Genesis whimsically provides videos which he, I'm sorry, whimsically calls answers with Ken Ham. And he says, uh, I don't believe climate change. The earth is now cooling again. And this is where he crossed the line for me. Sorry, climate change is a very, very serious business. And if you're going to indoctrinate a ministry or a congregation, and especially the young people, that it's somehow okay to deny the overall warming evidence for climate change, that's when you, that's when, uh, that's when I'm rolling up my sleeves. <laughs> and so I don't know how into this you are, but in the United States, we have this unique position and an extraordinary number of prominent people who deny climate change. Now, you guys, you'll hear people say, we've got to save the Earth. Well, as you, if you just stop and think for a moment, the Earth's going to be fine. <laughs> the Earth is going to be here no matter what we do. Well, I want to save the Earth for me. <laughs> My best friends are humans. <laughs> Parents are My old boss, of course. I'm <laughs> sure. And I'll just tell you guys, I go way back with this. This is my first kid's book in 1993. I did a demonstration about climate change. I did it on a show in 1994. I did it on Stuff Happens in 2005. I go on the air all the time, like with John Oliver, talking about climate change. So to have these guys running around saying that it's not happening is not in anyone's best interest. Then there was a moment that means something to me. Uh, he's not on the air anymore, but Pierce Morgan said to Mr. Ham right after the debate, uh, it's true you don't believe in climate change. And then Ken Ham said roughly, I, I never said that. I said, actually, you did. You say it all the time, actually. And I caught him. There's the same hand motion. <laughs> and uh, I remind everybody, uh, Mr. Ham is not from the U.S. And I know many of you are not from the U.S. Welcome. I love you all. We're humans. But when you grow up in the U.S., you don't know any better. You, we grow up thinking we could be president. We think, cool, the U.S. is great. And so uh, in the U.S. Constitution, is the, oh shoot, heavens, in the U.S. Constitution is the charge for our Congress to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. When we go to the voting booth, that's what we think we're promoting. That's what we believe we're doing. The only thing that keeps the United States in the game, economically, everybody, is innovation. The United States doesn't make that much stuff on our own soil. My clothes, very few of them, are made in the U.S. And we wear them, and it's okay, because we hire that out. If I can speak we, broadly we, as a mechanical engineer who grew up in the United States. And by the way, 45th anniversary of the moon landing uh, next week. Don't miss it. So, this, uh, this is what keeps us viable in the world economy is our ability to innovate. So if we raise a generation of Kentucky, Southern Ohio, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Texas kids who are not scientifically literate, that is a formula for disaster. Now, <laughs> but when you look at a picture like this, which is taken with spaceships, everybody. <laughs> no, people, it's common now. I mean, how much, if your cell phone doesn't tell you which side of the street you're on, you're like, what's going on? What's wrong with this? <laughs> Information comes largely 
not directly, but largely from outer space. The towers for your cell phone are put there with gold conditioning to within a few centimeters. Anyway, when you look at a picture like this, it looks like the Earth is out of focus. Now, to be sure, I have stretched it the clouds and you have to a little bit. It's not out of focus. It's that the atmosphere is so extraordinarily thin. If we had an extraordinary car that we could put on an extraordinary road and drive straight up for an hour, well, uh, the way people drive in Nevada, 45 minutes. <laughs> We'd be in outer space, like that. When I went to the World's Fair in 1965, <laughs> there were 3 billion people in the world. They had a total board that showed 3 billion people. Today, there are over 7 billion people. In my lifetime, it's more than doubled. That, combined with this thin atmosphere, is what is allowing our species to accidentally change the climate of a whole planet. So this debate was so, such a big deal. And I'm sorry, you guys, just going on. I mean, I didn't expect it to be such a big deal. I was writing a book about energy with St. Martin's Press. And you meet a lot of people who don't, I, I don't want to trouble anybody, but watts are metric units. <laughs> uh, volts and amps are metric units. Uh, the last country in the world that doesn't use kilometers we're sitting in. So I was writing a book about stuff like that. After the debate, St. Martin's Press, no, 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 you got to change, you got to change. We want you to write a book about evolution. And since I'm a, one of the world's foremost of what? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been hustling, you guys, and this is the cover of the book that's supposed to come out the first week of the science of creation. Because once again, once you appreciate what I like to call our place in space, once you appreciate what an extraordinary set of events have led to you and me, it really, I hope, is humbling. And it frankly fills me with reverence. And I, I just consider every minute, every moment that I have on the earth to be precious. And I do my best to live my life that we all do as, as best we can. So I really appreciate all your support. Now with that said, through a remarkable set of circumstances, I have not been killed in a plane crash. <laughs> but people have. And I want to just talk to you briefly as a former aerospace engineer who still has a license. <laughs> about uh, flight Malaysia Air Flight uh, 37. Okay, there are 17 conspiracy theories as of this morning. Oh, man. As of this morning, like, or I guess it was last night I captured this image. Maybe there's another one now. Uh, to those of you who have a conspiracy theory about Flight 370, I will say, as I said earlier, you may be right. You may be right. Uh, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's much more likely that it was just a series of screw-ups. And I mention this because I understand this will be on the web. I may be wrong, you may be right, but I just want to consider the following. Boeing 777's had some windshield problems about 10 years ago. There's a heater to keep the windshield from icing and there's some wiring trouble and they issue something called an airworthiness directive. And then, I'll tell you, I worked at Boeing when there's an AD, as it's called, everybody, the phones start ringing, everybody's running in circles. My boss kept a luggage by his desk packed, ready to go to any crash. Uh, it was on 747. Anyway, this was a serious thing and it got addressed, but that, the, what looks like lightning in the upper right is actually the sparks from one of the failures uh, that the, the guys in the cockpit took with, uh, I believe, my understanding was, just with their uh, smartphone. And it was a serious thing and it got addressed. It's possible, I'm not saying that's what happened, it's possible that the maintenance on MH370 wasn't done all the way up to snuff, or maybe things wear out. 
Now, this was the same crew that let uh, passengers in the cockpit. First to admit, these passengers have a certain look. <laughs> they, this guy routinely let passengers in the cockpit, which is not permitted, and you're supposed to be watching the instruments and so on. Now, let's say, hypothetically, the maintenance wasn't done quite so well. Or the guy, you know, when, you, when there's a mechanic on an airplane, there's another guy that watches him. That's all the other guy does. It's like you talk, making jokes about unions and stuff, but uh, with these so-called dual load path or flight critical or um, safety of flight issues, there's a guy that watches the people work to make sure they're doing it properly. Anyway, maybe that wasn't done, right? Maybe he signed off the clipboard without going to look at it. Then maybe this crew let people in the cockpit while one of them was in the lavatory, so there's only one guy, and then there was a leak. And then the guy in the cockpit got asphyxiated. And then, uh, in the electronics bay, the avionics bay, uh, back in my day, the limitation of aircraft electronics was how hot, especially the chips, the integrated circuits could get. And there were only certain integrated circuits that were literally more spread out on their substrate uh, that were qualified for flight. But computer science moved so, computer engineering moved so much quick, more quickly than the avionics industry. A new approach was taken 20 years ago, 25 years ago, to make the cooling system especially redundant, to make sure the avionics stay especially cool no matter what went wrong. And it's a strange thing at this high altitude, when it's very cold outside, you don't get much cooling because you don't have enough molecules of air to pump through the thing. So if there's a catastrophic failure, things could, hypothetically, I'm saying that's what happened, you may be right, uh, hypothetically things could overheat. And then the transponder would stop spawning. Right? And then this flight is some People are looking for it now in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now, if you've ever been out there, it is the trackless ocean. You look any direction, any time, it all looks the same. I mean, to find something in this, in this environment is extraordinarily difficult. If you had a needle in a haystack, you could use a magnet. Okay, but out there, it's just enormous areas uh, that are impossible, very difficult to uh, search it with any speed takes a long time. So uh, this is a, one of the many websites describing it as a news story where the plane uh, where is apparently had deliberate action, deliberate motions to avoid uh, Indonesian airspace. Uh, you may be right, but let me just emphasize there's a thing there, according to some reports, which to Jeannie's point is, uh, some unconfirmed reports. <laughs> it may be nothing. So I propose to you guys that it wasn't, maybe not my scenario, but something, a series of things that went wrong. And what goes wrong with a modern airliner, in my experience as a young engineer reading accident reports, is maintenance. It's when the maintenance isn't done properly, that's the only thing that goes wrong with a modern airplane. And so, uh, of course, that's a at large. That's what usually goes wrong. So I submit that it could be just a series of things that went wrong. Uh, but maybe maybe there will be a, a conspiracy, a conspiracy or maybe there will be evidence of foul play sometime. In the meantime, as you may know, uh, I uh, went to Cornell University and right on Gobi Red, and I'm pretty confident that it was a series of clerical errors. <laughs> I mean, the people I went to school with are so freaking smart. But through that process, through the sort of, I guess the university's got a lot to do, I stayed in, and I ended up in Carl Sagan's class, in the back of the room. And uh, he talked at length about uh, the Tunguska event which was uh, this crash of something in Siberia. If you are here in Las Vegas and you have time, I encourage you to go to Flagstaff or Phoenix and drive to Meteor Crater, Arizona. If, if you've never been, it is amazing. It's, a, it's amazing, excuse me. 
Oh, by the way, by the way, there's a subway sandwich shop. Right there. You park your car, you go up this thing, you go through the subway sandwich shop, and there's a museum, there's some meteorites, very cool, some explanations of the cosmic collisions and things. And then there are these doors, and you go through these doors, and there's this hole! There's this huge hole! Like, whoa! It's a mile wide, over a kilometer, a kilometer and a half wide. And it's uh, about as tall as the Washington Monument. And so this is evidence of the meteor hitting the Earth. And so I had Carl Sagan first run, and he talked about this. And then his kids, Sasha and Sam, watched the Science Guy show. I got invited to his house uh, after he died, and I, was, uh, I spoke at his memorial service. It's very moving and intricate. Then I got asked to be on, on the board of directors of the Planetary Society. And, uh, and I was cool, and I was vice president. And then four years ago, you know, I've met, you know, Neil Tyson's on the board, and uh, it's of Dan Jurassic. These guys are really into wine. <laughs> <laughs> they're collectors, you know. And so something happened, I left the room, and now I'm the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what happened. Uh, so I, this is now my thing. And uh, the uh, meteor crater in Arizona is really something about 25,000 years ago. The Tunguska event in Siberia was photographed in the, over a year after it occurred. And in my day, it was called the event. Now, everybody calls it an air burst. So you know the story, like if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and hit the water, it's like concrete and it will kill you. <laughs> well, that apparently is true. Uh, I've never tried it. But Apparently it's quite traumatic. And if you're a rock or a piece of ice coming into the Earth's atmosphere, it's the same deal. The air can't get out of the way fast enough. And you <laughs> explode. And you may recall, just a little over a year ago, a year ago, in Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, we had a bolide. The bolide is a fabulous Greek word. It means a meteor in the daytime. It says, I don't know why we have a whole other word for it. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's so much insurance fraud in, so in Russia, how much insurance for that? There's so much. <laughs> and, uh, there's all these dashboard cameras capture this thing. And so then people go up to the windows, wow, look at the streak of the bull light in the sky. And then the sonic boom arrived uh, less, just a little under three minutes later, two minutes, 50 seconds or so. <laughs> blew the glass into so many people's faces. There were all these lacerations and stuff. And we, if I may, dodged the bullet or a bull light. Uh, we got lucky. And the Planetary Society for many years has been funding the search for these objects, near-Earth objects, NEOs. In that same 24-hour period, an asteroid that had been identified in 2012, 2012 DA-14, and DA is this fabulous system where they take the first two weeks of every month and give it a letter. Uh, and that was another meteor, another Earth object, very, very large, would have been what do we call what I like to say, they're city killers, county, kill, county killers, country killers, and cotton killers. This was somewhere between county and, and country, and it missed. So we at the Planetary Society advocate developing the means to deflect one of these things. Uh, and uh, this would be an extraordinary effort taking people around the world to do this. And I was at Ted, you know Ted, you know, right on Ted. And I said, yeah, put on side, we were to deflect asteroids. Ah, 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 ah. No, no kidding. Uh, when I was in, um, well, I guess it was second grade. I had the same teacher from first and second grade. It was McDonald. And she read from a book. I did. Uh, she read from a book. Um, the ancient dinosaurs were killed because they had small brains. And the mammals took all their food and they died. <laughs> and even she knew that I was just lame. I mean, I'm a Tyrannosaurus, you are a rabbit? <laughs> Step is trap. So uh, the Deccan traps. 
in the decking, the decking stair steps of any area. There's big volcanism. Atmosphere was troublesome. Ancient dinosaurs having trouble. But then the meteor. <laughs> Uh, uh, that was in the earth, and uh, so it made a big noise, and that was trouble. But uh, now uh, we have a pretty good idea of what finished off the ancient dinosaurs. And I don't want to go that way. This is not my thing. I don't want the earth to get in with an asteroid and, and end everybody's life. It sounds like a drag. Uh, red hot rocks. The injecta from the thing was bigger than the diameter of the earth, and dust went halfway to the moon. I mean, that's a big thing. It wasn't an especially big rock. So what would we do about it? Uh, let me just start by saying, don't send Bruce Willis. <laughs> it's just that that's not. You don't want to blow it up because you'll probably end up something going wrong. Some piece of it will still be headed the wrong way, and you can't guarantee you're going to blow enough of it up and so on. So we don't want to blow it up. Instead, we want to give it an edge. <laughs> if an asteroid's going typically 20 kilometers a second, not a mile an hour, a sec 20 kilometers a second, you want to deflect it about 2 millimeters, about a 10 millionth of its uh, momentum. So people have talked about, we'll land a rocket on there and we'll turn on the motor. <laughs> But no, you can just 
fly past it. 60 orbits, 30 orbits, you know, zip, 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 bigger plane. What if we found evidence of life for $2 billion? I mean, it would change the world. It would change the world. Whoa. And so, yes! <laughs>
Now, for several years, I've been in the electric vehicle community. I had the EV1, the electric vehicle one. I had the Mini Cooper Electric. I was a test driver on the Bolt, the Chevy Bolt. I had the Nissan Leaf for three years. That was a great car. And I know, I know a guy who has a Tesla. <laughs> We could, I got a copy, uh, overnight, uh, one of the smart guys. And so, if we could store energy in everybody's car, you know, the same way we know how many toilets flush at half time, we know where everybody's car is. We could move energy around in this crazy, efficient way. And people, especially in uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, are pursuing liquid metal batteries. These would be batteries that you let be hot on purpose. The limitation of electric vehicles is the batteries that get warm and they lose their capacity, can't hold as much oomph. But these batteries are molten metal. There's a layer of molten magnesium, a layer of molten table salt, and then a layer of antimony or antimony that's next to tin on the periodic table. And you can store energy. You wouldn't put it in cars. Liquid metal in cars, not your first choice. <laughs> but we had it maybe in the basement of every building in Las Vegas. And we'd store the energy there. Then we have a smart electrical kit grid that the kids with their electric computer machines are going to figure out. And then we would send it around the world on carbon nanotubes. And this is where Rick Smalley said it's like the electrician, the electron has a dream that one end of the tube travels through and wakes up at the other side with uh, no electrical resistance. If that were to come true, you guys, we could change the world. I was at um, at the ceremony at the Wide Rift Congress, where Carl Sagan's papers were uh, put into the archives. And at the same time, Carol Porco was a chief of the principal investigator on the Cassini mission to Saturn, submitted this picture. This is a picture of the rings of Saturn, as seen from the south, if you will, from below, by human standards, from below them. And uh, it's a striking picture. The rings are extraordinarily thin and these wonderful colors. There are patterns, there are gaps in the rings that obey strict, fabulous mathematics, Heidegger values, and so on. But it's also, if you're not familiar with it, a picture of the Earth. The Earth is right there. Mm -hmm. and that's it. The Earth is that dot, that pinprick. If we could go up this way, 100,000 kilometers or so, the same view looks like this. And there's the Earth right there. So when I think about this, I cannot help but reflect on my third grade teacher, Mrs. Cochran, who told us there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on the beach. And I just remember thinking, Mrs. Cochran, have you, have you been to a beach? <laughs> It, I wouldn't have said it this way, but um, Mrs. Cochran, are you high? <laughs> There's no way, lady. There's no, when you're on a beach, there's sand everywhere. And you look this way. I, I grew up uh, back east. We go to Delaware. You look this way, 1,500 nautical miles. There's just sand. You look behind you, there's sand. You shuffle your feet, there's sand. The tide goes out even a little bit. There's more sand. <laughs> but there are, are apparently about 100 times more stars than all of that, all over the world combined. And I remember thinking, looking at the night sky on the same trip, at all the stars, and thinking, you know, I am not that different from a grain of sand, really. I mean, if you're looking at me from out there, you can't see me. I'm just a dot, a speck, standing on the sand, which is a bunch of specks. I'm just a speck standing on a speck. A bunch of other specks. The Earth is a speck, right? Just a speck orbiting the sun, completely unremarkable star. Nothing special about it. I'm a speck standing on a speck with a bunch of other specks orbiting a speck with other specks in the middle of specklessness. I suck.
process and the body of knowledge of science, the way that we reason, that's what makes us different from so much of what's around us. That is how you and I, working together with an optimistic view of the future, can, dare I say it, change the world. Thank you all very much.